the impact of uh, COVID-19 um, on uh, children and young people with special educational needs and uh, our witnesses today are from the National Autistic Society Northern Ireland and Evangelical Alliance Northern Ireland. Can I refer members to a covering note from the clerk at page 124, a covering note and a copy of the Left Stranded report from the National Autistic Society at page 128, a copy of the NASNI and Autism NI Broken Promises report at page 142 and related papers from uh, Evangelical Alliance at page 178. Can I welcome then Mr David Smith, Head of Northern Ireland uh, Evangelical Alliance, uh, Ms Donna Jennings, uh, Church and Mission Coordinator Evangelical Alliance Northern Ireland and Ms Sherelle Stewart, Director National Autistic Society Northern Ireland by Starleaf and Miss Caroline Bogue, Family Support Worker, National Autistic Society, Northern Ireland by Starleaf. You're very welcome to the Education Committee today. The committee has received a number of reports and numerous items of correspondence indicating the impact of COVID-19 lockdown and restart on children and young people with special educational needs. Members are therefore interested to hear um, about the experience that your organisations have had with this particular issue. Can I advise witnesses that the committee will give uh, each organisation about five to ten minutes each to make an opening statement, followed by questions from the members. Um, we will hear from NAS first and then from Evangelical Alliance. So can I hand over to Sherelle? Okay, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Thank you, Chair, and uh, to the committee for giving us an opportunity to present our Left Stranded um, report. Most of you will know a little bit about the National Autistic Society Northern Ireland. We are part of a UK-wide organisation and provide uh, services, support, advice, and a campaign on behalf of autistic people and their families. In Northern Ireland, we run a variety of services for children and adults across the spectrum and their families. This includes one-to-one -one family support service, education rights and transition advice service, a capacity building program for autistic adults in the Northern Trust, social activities for children and young people um, and adults, and social skills training, summer schemes, and a branch network of parents groups across Northern Ireland. Uh, actually, earlier, just this, year, just last year, we opened the first autism-specific centre for children and adults in Northern Ireland who had complex, uh, who had complex needs. So, at the heart of this is day provision for adults with autism and complex needs who really require high levels of support. So, the National Autistic Society's Left Stranded report is a UK-wide report which examines the impact that coronavirus has had on autistic people and their families during the first pandemic. The inequalities that autistic people and their families face aren't new, and as many of the committee know, the National Autistic Society Northern Ireland has been highlighting them for years. But coronavirus has really led them bare and deepened those inequalities. We're now entering the second wave, and we are extremely concerned that this will have an enormous effect on autistic people and their families who, quite frankly, feel abandoned and forgotten during this period of time. Just to give you an overview of, of the top line figures within the report, um, compared to the general public, autistic people in June and July were seven times more likely to be chronically lonely, six times more likely to have low life satisfaction, nine out of ten autistic people worried about their mental health during lockdown. One in five family members had to reduce work due to caring responsibilities, and seven in ten parents said their child had difficulty understanding or completing schoolwork, and around half said that their child's academic progress suffered. The survey also found that those requiring support all of the time were significantly more affected by lockdown so what I mean by that is those children and adults who would have autism and very complex needs who require at least one-to-one, two-to-one, or sometimes three-to-one support. Um, as this is the Education Committee, I'm going to highlight some of the, dif the difficulties that autistic children in education across the spectrum have faced during COVID-19. 
but also just to highlight that there has been um, a double whammy for those with very complex needs. So as well as losing the structure of education, i.e. Their, their school, they have also um, lost whatever the short uh, break services they would have availed of and many of the social activities that also would have been part of their routine. So education is vital for all young people to build a future, but for autistic children, schooling meets many other needs also. Through school, autistic children gain the skills that they need to transition, to build relationships, and the routine of school provides them with stability. And without that routine, routine and structure of, of everyday life, of, of school life, many have suffered great anxiety. Autistic children have found completing school tasks more challenging than their neurotypical peers. So 68% of family members said their autistic child was anxious at the loss of routine. 65% couldn't do work online. And seven in 10 parents told us their child had difficulty understanding or completing school work. And around half said their child's academic progress was suffering. And just to, to let you know what that actually means in reality. So one of the Northern Ireland parents in our survey said, I feel completely alone and unsupported with a child who is regressing further into his own bubble on a daily basis. I haven't been outside in 11 weeks and I haven't had a break in so long. He has not been able to do any schooling as home is home and school is school, causing massive meltdowns and trauma. I'm also going to highlight a number of cases of young people um, who we have been supporting to give you an idea what this lack of schooling has actually done to them. So the case of a 15 year old uh, young person in year 10 of grammar school. This young man normally has a classroom ass assistant to help, to help him learn and to keep him uh, on course and focused. This year, none of that support has been available and he has fallen behind, especially in his maths. But it is the anxiety that he is going to feel that is causing so much problems. So it is really causing him extreme anxiety and mental health difficulties. Another example is a young lady in uh, year 12 in grammar school, who is basically, according to her mum, fallen apart when her daily weekly structure was pulled apart. During the pandemic, this year, young woman lived her life in her bedroom. She ate, slept, and lived in one room. Online learning did not work for her and she is still very angry. She was unable to sit her exams and was inconsolable at this. So the isolation has taken a dreadful toll both on this young person's education and also their mental well-being. Fundamentally, this pandemic has led bare the lack of understanding of autism within our education system. Online schooling, even for those who are academically able, has failed them. One of the statistics I referred to earlier also highlighted the profound difficulties explained, experienced by those who needed the most, most support. And this was also very uh, apparent in education. So again, we're talking about um, those families whose children have autism, a severe learning disability, and would display their, the challenges they face in distressed or challenging behavior. Um, these children are ex extremely vulnerable and under the guidance should have been allowed to access a school placement if it was in their best interest to do so. But what we found was that the complexity of these young people who would most have benefited had their complexity used against them. When families requested to school and the EA that their young person attend school as they were vulnerable under the guidance, they were told that their children were too complex. So the very children and young people who were deemed as the most vulnerable, identified by social services as such, were denied a place in school because of their vulnerability. They were told that um, this was because they couldn't socially distance, they needed help with personal care, and they, could, they wouldn't have access to the therapeutic services that they needed. I find this really rather distressing because the guidance is meant to protect those that were most vulnerable, but in this case, it was actually used against those who were the most complex and those who needed the, more, the most support at this period of time. 
The lack of understanding in the system in the system was highlighted um, when families were told by the Department of Education and EAA that systems were in place to, for these young people, i.e. online teaching and also access to counselling. Many in this group of young people have little or no speech, so do not and could not access any of these services. Parents end up, ended up driving their children around for hours on end, trying to cope and soothe their distressed behaviour. Now, to put that in context, we wouldn't expect a support worker or a classroom assistant to work 24-7 over a six-month period of time, but really this is what we have expected parents and carers to do during this period. We've been talking about the second wave since the first wave began, yet where are the plans to deal with the second wave? We basically need urgent action now to ensure that autistic children and young people are not failed again. We need those making the decisions to understand autism in all its complexity. We've talked before about mandatory training for teachers, um, but that really needs to be across the whole of the education sector. Um, we also need better cross cross working between health and education to su provide support during what now appears to be our second wave. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, um, for that uh, testimony. Um, my understanding is that Caroline has had some technical difficulties, so yeah. uh, okay. Um, content for me then to move to David and uh, Donna. You're very welcome, David. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Chair, committee members. I'll be very brief. The Evangelical Alliance believe there is a biblical mandate for the church to care for and about the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, and Christianity has had a long history of involvement um, in health and education, pioneering many schools and hospitals, and this practical involvement continues today. Our research UK-wide during the COVID period shows that 90% of Evangelical Alliance member churches um, surveyed are providing support for vulnerable people and around 75% of those are working collaboratively with other churches, charities and local authorities. And as the pandemic has unfolded, we and many of our members have become deeply concerned for the welfare and well-being of children affected by disability, their families and their carers. And I'll hand over to Donna, my colleague, now to expand upon this further. Thanks, David. Uh, yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Donna Jennings. I have met many um, MLAs in this, in the capacity I'm here with, not just in the role of Evangelical Alliance, but as a parent and advocate for this sector. And uh, I've worked with Sherelle many times uh, previously. Uh, it's a privilege to do so again, Sherelle. Uh, before we begin, begin, I think it's necessary to make a distinction between this conversation and the ongoing debate around school closures in this season. While there is some overlap, today we are highlighting the specific needs of a very vulnerable sector of the education system. And for this reason, I refer to the cross-departmental actions for vulnerable children and young people, which is currently under consultation. The children that we are talking about, that Sherelle has already mentioned, have been identified in this document um, as um, having a social worker within the LAC system, children with disability, children with a statement of educational needs, or children who are on the edge um, of receiving support from social services. There are three areas that I want to bring to your attention today. Uh, the nature of the need, which completely aligns with what Sherelle has spelt out, uh, of these very vulnerable children. The gaps in the system, as we have looked back, and the specific requests for action as we look forward uh, for the good of the children and their families and for the long-term sustainability of already stretched services. The need to illustrate, I will recount my own family's experience. Uh, please do not hear one personal story. I tell our story as it speaks of many, many families' experiences of lockdown across Northern Ireland, some even more challenging with fewer resources than my family had. Uh, my son Micah is 12 years old. He has a diagnosis of autism, severe learning disability, challenging behaviours, sensory processing disorder and sleep disorder, to name a few. Micah is non-verbal. He does not navigate his way through this world with the use of words. His autistic neurology presents in a rigidity of thought processes which require routines, familiar people and places to make sense of his world as well as using autism-specific communication strategies and behavioural interventions. These keep Micah at a functional level. He requires ongoing therapeutic daily interventions delivered within the school setting. 
Without any of these, as per summer holidays or Christmas holidays in normal times, challenging behaviours and anxiety levels are exacerbated. Micah, in normal time, needs one-to-one -one constant care. Many children we're talking about in school have two-to-one constant care. In normal times, these are delivered to children like Micah as per their statement of educational need and their individual education plan that provide the small detail of the statutory duty placed upon the education authority to meet the assessed needs. As well as the education provision, children like Micah have an assessed care plan through the Health and Social Care Trust. According to families' assessed needs, they will receive X amount of hours respite and overnight stays in a trust facility. Provision from education and health and social care for families like ours in normal times is essential. These services are essential in order to keep our families in one piece, including these family siblings, and to let us care for our children at home for as long as possible, which is what we want and which is what makes the LAC system manageable. What happened over lockdown? The need increased, but the services disappeared. In March overnight, the statutory services, which are essential, completely shut down. Families like ours went from having X amount of our support uh, in the care of their children, the routine, the therapies, the intervention, the behaviour management uh, from education and from respite services, it all went to zero overnight. For Micah and many children like him, anxiety levels soared, mental health dropped, because of the high levels of anxiety, children like Micah can present with extremely challenging and often aggressive behaviour. And I know many other children like Micah's behaviours were extreme during this time, presenting in self-injurious, harmful to siblings, parents and property. Because of the anxiety levels soaring on top of an existing sleep disorder, I would say on average, my family and families that I know got an average of two to three hours sleep per night for seven months as well as holding jobs, as well as homeschooling, as well as caring for Micah one-to-one. -one. Under the Coronavirus Act, the services which in normal time would provide the essential support for Micah disappeared under the guise of best endeavours. And my husband and I, as Sherelle has pointed out, were left to care for Micah ourselves. And here is the gap. Although it was stated that children with a statement of educational needs could attend schools as a vulnerable child, this did not materialise as special educational needs schools were closed and did not open. The mechanisms uh, were, which were later introduced were not functional. The two clubs which stood up um, in normal times to provide after-school childcare foresaw the crises which were going to occur and prioritised their caseload and created a new system of care for these families. Uh, Solas throughout the year would use council premises to run their after school clubs and summer provision, but during lockdown the council refused to make their centres and premises available to them, and so partially in this role and my role and the links that I have, we secured the use of church buildings volunteers to meet this need and to strengthen capacity and to renew agencies who were already stretched. It is sobering today, and I hope it is sobering, that not all families have come through this time intact. The high level of family breakdown is seen in the fact that the trust facilities that provide overnight respite as a preventative service were and now are officially closed to our families because their remit has become a residential care centre for children who were taken into the care system because of family breakdown in this sector. The impact on school closures and respite facility closures has been great. Where are we now? As we enter a second wave, parents and children and their siblings have still not recovered from the trauma we have lived through. We know that we need school and trust support to care for our children. As we sit now, hoping that this is going to be a two-week circuit breaker, then looking ahead to the Christmas holidays and a per possible early 2021 circuit breaker, there is less resilience, less support being provided for these families. This, uh, the education system and the respite facilities must be recognised as essential services and prevented from being closed down again. In order to facilitate that, they must be fully resourced and everything they need to remain open to support children like my son. As we look back, so that we can look ahead, 
As I contacted many departmental heads on an ongoing basis, many MLIs, several, several of you engaged in this committee, it became clear that there were significant gaps in the processes which need to be addressed if we're going to move forward and to do what is just and is right for the welfare of these children. The most important gap was that in normal times, all the services that were considered as essential were permitted to downgrade to best endeavours under the Coronavirus Act. Best endeavours turned out really to not be very much at all. If in normal time these services are considered as essential, assess need for families like ours, in a pandemic, were they not even more urgent and essential? Why were services allowed to disappear? And who is standing over the various people responsible in what best endeavours turned out to be? Shirelle is right. Families like mine and my friends and my contacts in this area feel like we have been completely abandoned. We know we cannot care for our children long term or effectively without these support structures. And we want action that will grant these services to be made essential and grant these school systems staffing everything they need to be able to function in that capacity. The vulnerable children um, document, which I'm referring to here, uh, the cross-departmental action, section 3.4, suggests that essential services should be maintained. I am asking today that essential services for education and respite uh, facilities would be granted, not maintained. That's an important note. This was the largest gap. Without essential services, school principals had no mechanism with which to compel their staff to come to school to provide this essential support. Gaps uh, in the discussions taken at these top tables within the Education Authority, the Department of Education, MLAs and this committee. There was a serious gap between this sector and the awareness of what really happens at grassroots levels for staff and pupils in the SEND sector. And the vulnerable children exemption is a classic example of this. Several weeks into lockdown, I was contacting some of you in this committee and you were telling me that, no, 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 it's okay. Your son can go to school because he has a statement of educational needs. And it was me who told you, no, no, the SEND schools are closed. And there are other examples of gaps uh, in, in that uh, area. But gaps also with, between the various departments to work coherently and collaboratively for a creative and a long-term response to the issue. This document, which is currently under review, the, is a cross-departmental, and that's very nice, but we recognise the gaps between the education service, the communities department, and the health and social care department in working together. It seemed that there was a lot of red tape, a lot of risk assessment, um, which prevented a collaborative approach. This was not a time for red tape and for risk assessments to say no to requests from the other department. This was a time for uh, two departments who do not function uh, well or effectively at, uh, in, in the ongoing time to come together creatively for the good of the children and the families. I think the foundational gap was not new in lockdown, but it existed and was exacerbated and intensified during lockdown. And that is the long-term lack of understanding of the nature of this specific cohort of children that Sherelle has referred to, who present with complex and challenging needs. This is not just children with a statement of educational needs, that is a very wide category of child. There has been much focus in this committee on the statementing process within the SEND sector, rightly so, and I would ask uh, for that focus to be spread out towards those who already hold a statement and for the schools who are seeking to meet the needs of this complex and challenging child in school on a daily basis. You may recall on the 12th of March at this committee, school principals called for a more comprehensive guidance because they felt that the guidance being given to them at that point for coronavirus was completely irrelevant for the more severe and profound children in their care. Uh, the guidance given has fallen largely short of what school staff are dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, personally, when I saw the guidance come from DA uh, and working with principals in this area, I find the gap here to be insulting to my son's humanity and to the staff who care for him without adequate resource or guidance. The narrative was uh, that the school would provide digital learning activities. The significant cohort of children cannot access that, and so there is an equality issue here, referred to in section 1.5 of the vulnerable children's um, actions. But on this note, and please committee take this on board, 
Statistically, we are seeing that this cohort of children is a significantly growing demographic in the SENS sector. In 10 years' time, these specific needs, complex and challenging, will dominate the entire SENS sector. And I, many school principals and governors, find it very concerning that two public consultations have been released last week that will radically reshape the SENS sector without an adequate engagement or detailed understanding of what this significantly growing and demanding sector in the education system really needs. We are all in agreement that the SEND sector needs an overhaul, but it will still not be fit for purpose unless the specific needs of this growing demographic are understood and addressed and schools resource to meet this need that lies ahead. Our major ask today is that the recognition of the COVID-19 failures are seen to be not just uh, short term in the COVID moment, but systemic and reflective of a lack of understanding of who is in the SENS system, the nature of their needs, and what is required for schools to meet these needs. The ask primarily is to grant leg legislative changes that notes that these specific children should be given provision through schools and in healthcare uh, as essential services. And this is urgent. We cannot wait for this consultation to pass, be processed and advice given. This is urgent. We are now in a second wave. This will also require prioritisation and allocation of extra resourcing to these schools to make it happen, particularly around the need to boost and bolster staffing, uh, which is detailed already in this plan. Prioritisation of testing for staff and pupils. Clear and consistent guidance from PHA to mitigate against any unnecessary absence from school. And a set of guidance from DE which is reflective of the very complex needs of these children. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, David and, and Cheryl. Um, I, I, I find much of this um, evidence fairly distressing. Um, and that's only um, hearing the evidence. Um, you have lived through these circumstances and we're extremely grateful for you taking the time to bring that testimony to the Education Committee today. Um, it is profoundly concerning to hear aspects of what you're referring to in terms of families feeling abandoned, um, but also that the inadequate response during lockdown um, insulted the humanity of children. Uh, that's, that's powerful um, and, and an accurate and a, a lived experience. Um, you're right and obviously quick to move us to what actions need to be taken to ensure that that is addressed and that um, it, it, it does not continue. Um, the, the Education Committee had asked the Minister and the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Education regularly what was being done to work with the Department of Health um, and Health and Social Care Trusts to ensure that these needs were being met. Um, but as you've also said, as those needs increased, services disappeared rather than being <coughs> put in place. One, one proposed mechanism of trying to respond to those needs, um, as, um, as I think you have said, was not functional, was the, the multidisciplinary panel. Um, can, I, can I ask Sherelle and Donna, and this will be my question before I bring other members in, um, what, what was the um, contribution of the multidisciplinary panel can it be improved as a mechanism to meet some of these needs, or, or do we need a, a completely different approach? Maybe start with Sherelle and then come in to, to Donna. Okay. Um, yes, well, basically, the, uh, as you know, um, we have been uh, conversing quite a lot, um, Chair, um, with you on these multidisciplinary um, panels. And actually, we thought initially that this was going to be a very good system for taking forward. Uh, the needs of these young people who had very complex needs. But really what happened in practice is that there still seemed to be a, a lack of understanding of the needs of these children. So although those multidisciplinary disciplinary sessions did eventually happen, I mean, we had already been refused by, and I know in my, my own family's case as well, we had already been refused um, on the basis of complexity so we'd been refused that school place 
Um, even though he had been identified by psychiatry and social services as, as needing it. So there has, they, the, the multidisciplinary thing, I think there was a lack of understanding and, uh, and our children were still being regarded at that point as being too complex to a feel of, of services. And then when, when the situation was actually resolved, it was two weeks before the closure of schools for summer, and that was really only to offer part-time placements um, on random days, and which for a, a child or a young person who has autism, what they really need is structure in place and not random provision. So I think there was a complete lack of understanding of these young people. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Donna, would you like to respond to that as well? Uh, yes, um, my, my understanding um, of the situation was that the children's disability team, which the, the social care department and education were uh, in conversation regularly, very regularly. Um, the children's disability team had identified a list of children and were requesting that specific schools would reopen to these children. Um, we were in, in terms of, of school, uh, I think there were other children who were not identified by the children's disability team. There was no set criteria or protocol or process for the identification of these children. Um, then the schools were requested to provide a service through school um, in a way that social workers were not being asked to to engage with these children. So school staff were being expected to engage with children, whereas social workers were um, not given permission from the children's disability team to enter houses. Um, there was a bit of a, a double standards, I think, which didn't go down very well. But essentially, education risk assessed against the requests made by the children's disability team, uh, risk assessed in a way that did not mitigate towards action together collaboratively, risk assessed to say no. Um, there were other, my understanding is that there were other solutions suggested from education, for example, the classroom assistants who would be working on a one-to-one -one basis with the likes of my son or other children in that school. It was suggested that they could go into our homes to give us support to care for our children um, and a, the, the, hours of the, the school hours, but that the education authority said, no, we're, they're not sure to do that. There seemed to be a lot of red tape risk assessing um, between the departments, within the departments, uh, in a way that did not have the best interests of the children at heart. And th th those inadequacies, I, I presume, are being experienced by you again this week, due to closures again this week? That's right, yes. Um, so we are, our son is at home with us. Again, the only respite provision available to us is uh, the two clubs, Solas and Kids Together, who uh, again are functioning out of church buildings uh, because they couldn't get premises. Okay, uh, and as much as the, the aim of the executive can be to avoid school closures, a, a plan must be in place to, a contingency plan for if and when they do occur that children with complex needs and challenging behaviours and their families have the support that they need in that situation. That's right. Back in, in March and April, when there was a lot of toing and froing between the CDT and the education, uh, I spoke to the, um, some department heads, uh, principals at that stage, and we said, if you're saying no, you cannot do this now, the risk was high then, the fear factor was high, um, then you get a volunteer force, you get a workforce that will be ready to go, that will be vetted, trained, to swoop into these families' aid when the time comes. That never materialised. Uh, we, the, the summer provision was announced um, after the Education Committee met one evening by Peter Weir. We heard about it on the news. I think several principals heard about it on the news. Um, it's, the, it's actually the Education Authority who organises summer provision for special educational needs schools. But again, there was no... Uh, it was too late. There was no forward planning. There were no mechanisms to get the staffing at that point um, in place. And in the end, the summer provision, which would normally be at least 10 days of a, a school day, we had 1.5 hours per week for four weeks. I'm keen to bring other members in here as well and answer in the, in the level of detail that is appropriate 
to to you individually, both of you. But um, I, I go to Donna first and and come to Sherelle. Um, Donna, two to three hours sleep mm-hmm. over an eleven week period. What what does that do to you and yeah. your family? Yeah. Um, we we managed to hold down two two jobs between us. We we did a tag team. We um, yeah, sleep lack of sleep is not new to us, but this was hard going, and it is not two to three hours of sleep where you're lying in bed awake. The rest of the ev- the the night, you are physically with your child in a very physical capacity. Uh, we um, families like mine, children were putting their heads through windows, um, breaking their parents' arms. Uh, my daughter herself, we um, she suffered from a tick because of the high level of stress that she was under. Um, in the house with her brother constantly. Thank you. Sherelle, would you like to speak about the impact on your family? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak about the impact on, on my family and I, I suppose other families really who are very, very um, similar and who attend quite a lot of our services. And basically, you know, a lot of the time was spent basically driving our young people around for hours on end. So, for example, you know, there would be a morning shift where we would drive for three hours. So we'd come back, maybe have lunch, and then, you know, someone else would go out and drive for another few hours. Um, and this really basically went on that we were driving probably about 10 hours per day, just trying to uh, put some, some kind of system uh, in, in place. But also, I mean, a lot of our... Um, a lot of our young people became very mentally unwell and this really basically um, resulted in distressed behaviour, which meant that there was an awful lot of damage to our houses or to ourselves. Um, and basically that affects the whole family um, and myself and other, myself, my husband who's a lecturer, um, all had to, and, and other families like us all actually had to take time off work. I, I had to take time off work for the first time in 13 years because basically it just wasn't sustainable. Thank, thank you both for sharing that direct impact on, on your families. Um, I know you've had to do it quite a lot um, on, on media and now at an Assembly Education Committee and we will do all we can to try and make sure you don't have to do it for too much longer before you get the type of response that, that you and the other families um, you advocate on behalf of deserve. Um, can I bring in Karen Mullen, MLA, Deputy Chairperson? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Israel, David and Donna. I suppose I really don't know where to start, to be honest. Um, I have to say... Donna, thanks very much for that powerful testimony, sharing your personal story um, and yourself, Sherelle, um, the great work that all of these are doing. Um, it's not only distressing for us, um, I, I feel very distressed and, and shocked, totally frustrated for yourselves as parents uh, to hear that you were having those engagements with departments and um, nothing was had changed, improvements were met, support wasn't put in place. I suppose I had a number of things down here, but I think after listening to this, you know, uh, I don't even know if it's uh, it's the right way of questioning, but I suppose I continuously raised as well as members on this committee um, that as no child should be left at home come September. Past experience, non-COVID past experience um, would, would have been um, alerted me that this could happen anyway. We know it happens every September, unfortunately. And at that stage, I suppose, or, or weeks and months before, we were highlighting this to ensure that we knew that in terms of COVID um, and bubbles and risk assessments, that it was going to be even more difficult for autis- autistic children um, and children with special education needs. So we'd asked the minister for those assurances um, some questions I got responses to, um, very general in relation to risk assessments about the work of the multidisciplinary panel. But throughout this whole experience for me um, and, and my constituency and my community, 
I noticed, obviously we have been very focused in relation to the education journey on the panel, but I noticed that the role of health disappeared. They disappeared, the skulls closed, but they disappeared as well. And throughout this whole period, people are, have been um, you know, at home or working from all our places. Most of the staff um, in health and education weren't furloughed, so they were still working. So there could have been uh, strategies put in place to ensure that there was provision and support over that period. Before the summer, I had um, raised with the minister to explore church, community, buildings, and also all our buildings that I know within my constituency, we have a number of health trust day centres that were closed, that could have been open, that were big enough, that could have timetabled families and children to come in for different aspects of um, either respite or social engagement or whatever therapies and treatment that was needed. That didn't happen. Donna, you had said about gaps between departments um, and uh, for me, departments were not working together. They weren't working with the trusts and the trusts and they weren't working with charities like yourselves. They weren't working with community groups. And it's in all of this, it's always down to the parents and communities to lead, um, to go and organise and deliver. Um, and even in my own area, I had brought forward, you know, a number of buildings that could have been used and, and that did not happen. And it's shocking here to hear the reality of um, your day-to-day -day loved experience. We had no time to prepare in March, but we had time to prepare for September. And we also have time to prepare for the second wave. And yet, no, we haven't. In my own area, the trust has stopped the short rest time, respite short term, um, over two weeks ago. When I questioned, I am not been given any indication into when that will be come back or that they're looking at putting um, uh, all our types of support in place. It's just, they shut it, that's it, and you have to wait and hope for the best, which is absolutely not good enough, and it's, it's shocking. I suppose, I suppose I do have a question, Sherelle, maybe you could answer this, and it is around the Education Authority. You know, is there any scenarios or strategies or support that is being put, put in place by the Education Authority for children and uh, autistic children and young people, I know um, I, I was going to ask about you know an alternative to blended learning, but it's so much more. Um, and what is that level of support that is coming, at, at, you know, from the education authority? Thank you. Um, Karen, we have have heard nothing really from the education authority in terms of any kind of of planning that has gone into coping with the, the, the second wave. So as, as it stands now with the, the closure of, of schools, basically the young people, uh, the children and young people that we represent are off school again. Um, our, our young people really can't fail of this blended learning that people have talked about, about online um, learning. Our young people have no, um, many of no speech or very limited speech and also wouldn't engage with this type of, of uh, conversation. They're also really reliant to keep them steady is, is on routine and structure is vital because that's all that they really, really understand. So when that's removed from them, then it just has a really detrimental crisis resulting in extreme mental health problems and distress. But I think the thing that, that does quite upset me is the fact that there doesn't appear to be any planning in place if school closures happen again. And they are going to happen on different periods, periods of time. And I think that's what's really distressing because we've been talking about um, a second wave since the first wave. And now we're in that place and there doesn't seem to be anything planned for this, uh, these young people and children. And also, Karen, just to mention as well, I mean, there's a lot of adults as well who would have, I know this is the education committee, but there's a lot of adults who would have autism and very complex needs as well. And day service provision for them hasn't opened either. So this whole sector is actually really, really led there under this pandemic. Sherelle, thank you very much for that. Um, and it's just not, it's just not good enough in relation to the planning. Um, 100%, and I think I can speak for the whole of committee 
that we will do our utmost after this. And if I could just ask that the two pieces that yourself and Donna has read out, if you could read, email those in as well, and that'll help us going forward. Thank you so much again uh, for coming on today. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Robin Newton, MLA. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome the delegation here today and on uh, uh, Starleaf. Um, and like others, uh, I, I don't think I can appreciate um, just what you go through in, in normal circumstances uh, and, and uh, in, in these uh, difficult days. Uh, I don't think I can appreciate uh, what life must be like for you. I think uh, I would say, I mean, it is never the intention of the, of the minister to close schools uh, if he can possibly get agreement to keep them open. And that has always been his his intention. But I would like to explore just uh, with uh, Sherelle and Donna two two areas, uh, if I can. Um, and the first area really is in the left stranded uh, report, uh, and it's for for us. Uh, it's on page one three nine of our of our information pack, and just one paragraph out of that. To make sure autistic children and young people's educational needs are met and that no autistic child finds, uh, ends up wrongly held back from both going back to school on a full-time basis. And, and in that paragraph you're concentrating then just on children's education. On page, uh, again it's our pack, on page uh, one, 185. A much wider perspective is taken by Dr. Joan Henderson, uh, the managing director of SOLAS, when she's indicating that the lessons that must be learned from the last lockdown, um, and there are probably seven or eight there that she has, has, has recommended, particularly that schools must remain open, and in particular special schools. Could Maybe either of you speak to just, in the case of the schools staying open, what would that look like to you in a, if we had another uh, lockdown or recommended lockdown situation? Uh, and indeed, to pick up on the, uh, the, the separate points that uh, Dr. Joan Henderson has made. Sherelle, do you want to come in first and then come to okay. Don? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I suppose whenever we look at it, what we are we are saying is that fundamentally for this group of children or young people, there has to be provision put in place within a structured and routine environment that will enable them to feel secure and to mitigate against the very the, the massive decline in mental health and in which leads to very distressed um, behaviour. Um, that can be um, as eclectic really I suppose as what what we want. I mean Donna has talked about you know provision um, across different sectors and, and looking at that. But I think it is not not everyone suffers to the same degree, I suppose as well um, with, with regards to school closures. But there were children during this last pandemic that were identified as being the most in need. And I think that that was the point that we were trying to, trying to make as well, is that really basically the complexity of those young people was actually used against them in that um, they had the most needs, but because they had the most needs, they couldn't access any provision. Okay. Uh, in terms of the recommendation comes from the um, uh, from the health to say that schools should be closed. Um, what package would be put in place to support the children we're talking about? Well, I, I think there's a there is a fundamental problem with the whole system because um, at the start of this pandemic, Basically, everything that that um, our children and young people knew, um, their routine, their structure was abruptly pulled from under them. And although, um, and 
right at the beginning, I suppose we all kind of understood that we didn't know what we were dealing with. I suppose my problem is that we now know what we're dealing with. We now know that these young people are suffering disproportionately um, and we need to have education and health work together. But we can't reinstate some of the aspects of health as well because as I think Donna referred to it, um, in the Belfast Trust, during, during um, the pandemic, I know that we did a fail of some outreach work um, from Willow, which was greatly appreciated in that they came, um, this was later on, um, and they came and they actually took some of some young people and children out for drives or back to the centre. But the problem is that there has been a lot of families who have suffered um, family breakdown because of the stress. So the respite centres now are closed with no, no uh, possibility of them opening in the near future because they're housing young children, uh, children and, and young people who basically do not have uh, a full-time home. And there is a lack of residential facilities and community facilities here in Northern Ireland for those young people. So the only place that they can go at the moment is, is into the short break services on a permanent basis. And that means that, that those families who normally use that for short breaks um, can't access that services because under RQIA, they have to be re-registered, um, not as a short break service, but as a service providing full-time support. But we really do need to see health and education both coming together to look at what type of provision can be put in place to support children, young people and adults with very complex needs. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think um, there, there has to be a distinction made. You've referred to school closures. I, I would ask for a distinction to be made between school closures that, that are for everybody this week and closure of school as a service which is essential to children not just with a statement of educational need, but those who, who are likely to suffer from the, the severe impact that many families have already suffered from. Um, that involves um, identification of caseload um, co in collaboration, not just the children's disability team telling schools which children they need to serve, but a, a joined up approach um, of having a set criteria that um, identifies children who are at risk um, not having risk assessments that um, shut down any possibility, but open up possibilities um, with the use of every resource available. Um, depletion of staffing is a massive issue at the minute. It's a massive issue across the board uh, in every sector, but already um, certain schools, we have seen uh, days of school closure in the past number of weeks because of staff shortages in special educational needs schools. Um, and so it is touch and go for parents. In, in my own child's school, um, there have been, I think, two days where the school has been closed to everybody because they have not had enough staff. And so not just guaranteeing that school will be an essential service that will be made to stay open, but resourcing the principals to be able to stay open in terms of somehow creatively boosting their staffing uh, accordingly. Uh, for example, my, I had a few friends who work in therapeutic services from the Carlisle um, House or Bradbury House in speech and language therapy, occupational therapy. They were redeployed from health into nursing homes, not given a choice, but redeployed, told they have to work there, when actually their skill sets could have perfectly been used to boost the staffing within um, this sector. Um, again, cross-departmental uh, conversations did not happen. But on the back of that... The DE guidance is not fit for purpose for these children. And so it has to look like coming from the top with the DE and the EA recognising the complex and challenging nature of these children, which they do not, and resourcing school principals and staff accordingly through guidance that is fit for purpose. Just tell me, uh, in terms of uh, Dr. Henderson makes a point, the return of services as normality returns, which specific facilities are actually closed to you at the moment? Mm. Uh, well, school has opened. Um, it, it is functioning on a, a five-day-a-week basis, um, which we are very thankful for. 
Um, however, school is not open to all children. Um, there has been a question which I would ask you to engage with certain school principals on. There's a cohort of children who, because of their health issues, um, if, if they would require a procedure to be performed uh, because of their health in an emergency situation, it requires an, an aspirative uh, procedure. And the guidance is that that has to be done in a separate room. Many of these skills, because of how they have sorted out their social bubbles, do not have a separate room to be able to perform that. And school principals have been asking DE for specific guidance on this, still waiting. And so there is still a specific cohort of children not yet back in schools, middle of October. Um, and that has not been addressed, so I want to raise that today. Um, respite services um, in terms of... So the Health and Social Care Trust, they meet, they have assessed families like ours, our needs. Um, they give direct payments funding um, to provide, Micah gets 18 hours of uh, respite per week, plus four nights overnight respite in Willow Lodge, which is, its remit is for short breaks overnights. Um, he gets four nights per month. Um, that is closed to Micah currently. It has been closed um, throughout the pandemic. Uh, Micah received, um, I think it was into May, he started to receive because we were a family uh, recognised as being in crisis. He received four hours per week um, where they came and took him out, um, similar to the pattern that Sherelle mentioned for her son. Um, however, that is now... So the overnight services were... Ha have been since March close to us, only with a four hour per week uh, provision, but that has now gone. And so Willow Lodge as a respite facility has been closed to us on an ongoing basis because its remit has changed into a residential care system. Robin, I, I, I'm trying to be as generous as I can okay. with time to everyone here because just, of the importance of the issues, but just, I'm going to have to move us a little bit. Me, just let me finish. Thank you. I have to say I do agree with Dr. Joan Henderson in her last sentence. We can only ever judge a society by how well it treats its most vulnerable citizens. Yes. I think we can all agree on that. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Uh, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, David and Shane. I'm not, Shane, I'm not sure if Shane has joined us yet, but uh, most especially thank you, Sharelle and Donna, for your powerful, brave and disturbing testimony here this morning. My heart bleeds for what you've been through, what your families have been through and what other families have experienced during lockdown. And my, my heart mostly feel, bleeds for the, for the failure to the young children who have been left behind the system has failed. And I know, ladies, I know, I know you don't need my sympathy. I know you don't need our sympathy. You need to know that support will be provided. And I recently asked a question of the health minister. I just wanted to give me your your, your uh, response as to whether what he says rings true in terms of the similar written question I submitted. So I asked the health minister, or sorry, I asked the education minister, what contingency planning and support will be provided to assist parents and families of children with special educational needs, specifically with those with complex needs during and after the current restrictions? The education minister responded, the education authority is maintaining support services during the current restrictions for vulnerable children and their families. These services include counselling, child protection, welfare, health and wellbeing, and special educational needs specific supports. Health services and local trusts are continuing to work with parents during the restriction to provide therapeutic supports that best meet the child's needs where it is safe and appropriate to do so, in line with the NI Executive's new COVID regulations and restrictions introduced on the 16th of October and public health guidance. I have asked the Education Authority to develop options for, similar, for a similar model to engage to the Engage programme subject to securing funding to help address the impact of school closures in terms of lost learning on children and young people with complex needs in special schools. Joint health and education oversight arrangements continue to monitor support for those families and put in place multidisciplinary local level solutions where it is safe and appropriate to do so. How does that ring true to you ladies? Um, <laughs> I, d I actually don't recognise that. Firstly, I think what, it, what, it fundament what fundamentally jumps out to me is when they talk about things like counselling services, they, they again, there is a lack of knowledge about our children and young people and what we're referring to. My, my um, son has no speech. He communicates using a first and then type system. Counselling services mean nothing to him. He has no idea or would be able to engage with such services. So again, 
this goes back to the the complete misunderstanding about what we're talking about. We've had no engagement um, from the education authority around any of, of um, the kind of provision that they talk they they talk about. But quite frankly, um, my son and children and and adults like him, they need a structure, a routine, and a system that is the same. That and that is what keeps them on the street and narrow and basically talking about things like um, counselling services or blended learning via um, iPads or, or whatever or, or children can't engage with that so you know it does speak to me about a, a real lack of understanding on the department on the behalf of the Department of Education and the EA about the children that we have been talking about today. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Um, Let Donna come in there as well. Uh, Justin, yeah. Sorry, yes, I completely agree. When you were reading that out, completely foreign experience at grassroots level. And thank you for reading it out because it highlights the two points that I made. The gap between who, what the people at top table think is happening at grassroots level. And I wonder, does he actually believe that it is happening? Because it is not. We have seen no evidence of this. Um, in terms of my son's school, we are deeply appreciative of the, the principal and the staffing there and the energy, the high level of effort and thought that has been taken uh, within the school that recognises the trauma that these children have been through and the effort and the, the desire to keep school functioning for them as much as they can. Um, however, a massive gap between what is thought to be happening at top table and is happening at grassroots. Uh, the other gap, which is, I think is, is fundamental and key for this committee to take on board, especially as there is a consulta two consultations out at the minute. There is no understanding within the Department of Education and the Education Authority of the nature of this very complex and challenging <laughs> sector of the education system. And this is a growing demographic of the, the special needs um, sector. Um, and I would ask for an extensive learning and engagement that is measured uh, as you engage with certain principals who this is their daily job, this is their, their daily bread and butter, who already feel the shortfall and the lack of understanding. Okay, thanks, Donna and Cheryl. Listen, we as a committee have a duty to fight for you, for you as parents and for your children and for all the families like you. And that's our responsibility as a committee to ensure that their action is taken and we will we'll take that moment very, very seriously. I want to say, to finish very briefly, and that is, Leadership is a term that's thrown around willy-nilly and is bestowed on people who have very comfortable lives. The leadership you ladies are showing in your families and with other families is incredible. You're two incredibly brave, strong women. Be very, very proud of who you are. Thank you, Justin. Um, Robbie Butler, is Robbie there? Not sure if he is. I know he was endeavouring to get on via Microsoft Teams. I'll come back to... Um, Robbie, I think we have Catherine Kelly, MLA. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, everyone, for your contributions this afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for your contributions this afternoon. Um, it has been heartbreaking. Um, listening to your lived experience and the fact that this that the lack of support has directly impacted on you and on your family. Um, in OMA, uh, the National Autistic Society is a lifeline to the many families that I have seen firsthand um, that have availed of the services um, of uh, Olive and others. Um, and Cheryl, you'll know Olive well. Um, and that during COVID, this is and the, the lockdown that it was also um, a, a vital service and they made contact with families and supported families in every possible way. So I just wanted to mention mention the National Autistic Society um, and that and all of in particular. Um, the, the pandemic has shone a spotlight on the many gaps that were there pre-COVID um, and the need for a greater focus on supporting the education of our children and young people and adults with autism. There's no question that our teachers um, and classroom assistants are best placed 
um, to educate our children. And this situation has unfortunately meant that parents have had to become not just carers, but also educators in the most awful situation. It's important that the department and EA think outside the box this time um, so that the children and young people know, don't feel the isolation um, that they felt previously um, and before returning to school. And this is something that should be um, already be in the department's contingency plans and um, that they keep talking about, but that we haven't seen at this point. Um, yesterday, um, in the Children and Young People All Party Group, we also heard from parents um, whose children could not access a place in school during the previous lockdown, um, and this cannot happen again. The department needs to ensure that this too um, is in their contingency plans and that they do everything that they can to support our most vulnerable. Um, there is no doubt and it should go without saying that children with autism or complex and challenging needs deserve equality of education um, and that we support them as they grow into, into adults. And it, it's crucial that, that health and education work together. And I know both Sherelle and Donna have, have said that. Um, and it's, it, I don't understand why it's not happening. We have the Children's Services Cooperation Act. Um, it's there, um, and I don't understand it, especially during a pandemic, that this isn't happening um, to support our, our children and young people. Um, parents and carers shouldn't have to rely on schools being open to access support um, and health services for their children. Um, and as as we have already um, as has already been mentioned, that um, is something that has been an issue, an ongoing issue, whenever schools close at Christmas or um, during the summer, um, and it shouldn't be. Um, when when the restart guidance um, came out in August for schools, um, I had raised with the minister um, that special school guidance seemed to be an add-on just to the, the mainstream guidance. And what we had been said for weeks, saying for weeks um, to the department was that Special schools needed a particular focus. The issues aren't the same. The concerns aren't the same. Um, and unfortunately, that wasn't taken into consideration. Um, Chair, I don't actually have a question. Okay. Um, I just want to raise or to, to make a comment and to commend um, both Sherelle and Donna for their contributions this, this afternoon. Um, and to, to thank them so much and just that they are, to reiterate what Justin said, um, they're real, really strong women um, and your resilience knows no bounds. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we have Morris Bradley. Morris, you, you might, I think you might be muted, Morris. Technology. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't really have a question, uh, Chair, but I'd just like to thank everyone for their submissions uh, to the committee today. Uh, I know it's been extremely thought provoking, and I suppose knowing through, uh, who have, uh, to children, appreciate the stress on children and young adults, the stress on families, and the pressure on parents, mothers in particular. I'm also aware of the importance of structure and routine for children and young adults. And I'd be worried that in many cases, children and young adults uh, will suffer from setbacks that can occur when there's a long-term disruption to that routine and structure and that uniform system. And I think previous speakers have emphasized the need for this committee uh, to apply pressure on the DA, DE, uh, EA, and indeed the health department to address the lack of support for this sector. And I just can't thank you enough for your presentation here today. So, Chair, as brief as I can be, can be just thank you to everyone for, for highlighting this here and that we as a committee have a, a job of work to do going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Morris. That, that, that sums up well where, where we're at. Um, uh, as we close, um, Cheryl, David, Donna, can I, I echo the thanks that members have given you for for coming today to to raise these issues with us, um, 
it, it's quite clear that we need to urgently ask the Department of Education why the multidisciplinary panel approach is not resulting in access to school therapeutic services and respite services for children with special educational needs and in particular challenging behaviours. Um, are, are there any brief closing comments, we're tight for time, that, that, that you would like to make in terms of guiding our actions on your behalf? Sherelle? Um, I, I, I suppose it is really just emphasising um, to those uh, that, that can make the, the, the decisions about keeping schools open and about respite services and that kind of thing is that these families have been going through this for six, seven months already. We don't have the resilience there. There's nothing left within within ourselves, I think, to, to go for another six months through this. So we really do need people to take urgent action and start engaging with parents and, and carers and, and you know, autistic young people to, to, to actually understand what is going on and what is happening with them and to, to recognise that, um, you know, autism is a wide spectrum and, you, and there is a fundamental need, I think, for understanding um, of, of autism amongst DE and DEA. Thank you. Donna, David, do you want to make any? Brief uh, closing comments. Just to reiterate the ongoing long term need to really understand the need of these specific cohort of children, which is statistically growing. And in order to do that, um, engaging with the principals and school staff who are serving these children day to day and the parents and the carers of these children, uh, I would caution against coming out of this meeting and um, in name, in action, uh, granting an essential services um, um, mandate without actually listening to school principals and staff to ask them, what do you need now in order to make that happen? What will you need in January to make that happen? And what will you need in May, April, June to make that happen? I think that's an important point, yeah. yeah. And there are resources available in the community um, to you, and that's why we're here as Evangelical Alliance. Yeah, just to emphasise that last point, churches bring a message of hope, transformation, pastoral care, solidarity, um, and, and support, and, and there's buildings and volunteers and other things that can be offered, small offerings, but that set aside alongside other charities, other organisations, just to read the message that we're here, willing uh, to play whatever part we can to serve um, ar around this complex area. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the, the witnesses from our session today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all witnesses and add all members back into the spotlight until the end of the meeting and ask the clerk to summarise actions uh, resulting from the briefing? Um, okay, Chairperson, if uh, members can hear me, um, I think the, uh, what the minutes I think will probably show is that the committee uh, was very concerned about what it learned about the loss of respite for children and young people with ASD. Um, the committee is surprised that lessons were not learned from um, the first wave, and maybe is also very concerned about what reportedly an absence of understanding um, among the uh, organisations about uh, the needs of children with uh, autism spectrum disorder and that they are urging action. So, in particular, then writing to the departments, uh, asking them why the multidisciplinary panel approach has not worked in terms of um, preventing the respite being uh, withdrawn, um, urging them to issue um, guidance to schools around the treatment of children with aspirative issues and to provide related support. Um, also urging the department to consult meaningfully with teachers and principals around what they believe, what they want in order to uh, support children with uh, autism spectrum disorder. Additionally, then writing to the education authority, um, urging it to uh, provide uh, respite facilities for this group and uh, again, again urging it to work imaginatively with the department, Department of Health, DFC and other groups, churches and charities in order to like, imaginatively provide um, these respite facilities uh, which are clearly, um, as indicated by witnesses, uh, urgently and desperately required. Um, also members, uh, I would suggest to members that write these letters, we'll get our answers, 
but there's nothing to stop members from writing priority written questions on some of these matters as well, since the witnesses indicated there is a, a level of, uh, of urgency, Chairperson. Okay. Clark, could I, just in relation to the, the multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary panel correspondence, um, in terms of access to respite services, if we could add access to school and therapeutic services there as well, and um, for children with ASD, special needs and challenging behaviour. Members, any other comments? Sure. Yeah, Justin? i just make a point that they made, and it's a point that's uh, highlighted in the Minister's answer to me, and his words are, where it is it safe and appropriate to do so? And they've, they've highlighted the issue around red tape and risk assessment. And are those two things, those two issues being the blockage for these children getting the supports they need? Yeah, that, so, so I suppose to ask the Minister what action he and the Minister for Health are taking to, to ensure that it is safe and possible to, to deliver these services. I, I think that is the, the, those are the key the parts of that answer, Justin, that, uh, and of the evidence given today, that if, if it's felt that there, there is a risk of delivering those services, then that appears to be a blockage. But as the, as the families are, are, are saying, surely there has to be a way to overcome those risks in, or mitigate those risks um, with appropriate resources they're making clear as well. This is not just a case of telling schools you have to do this. Um, it's, it's and other types of services, but it's, it's equipping them for it to be safe for them to do so. Chair, can I come in there? Karen, yeah. Chair, I, I had a question to the Minister and he's going to see the question and see the answer a couple of weeks ago. And I was asking the Minister in relation to this because there was a question that bullet had to close in my own area. Um, what the department was doing to increase the supply of appropriate substitute teachers in schools, in particular for Irish medium and special schools. The answer I got just tells you that the department doesn't get it. EA doesn't get it. Um, so the answer is that the register is there with 9,300 uh, substitute teachers on it, and more than 500 newly qualified teachers have been added. Um, and that's my answer. That, that's, that, you know, but we're clearly being told. So we need the department and the education authority to be listening. And I think Donna, could, I don't know many times Donna said it there. Um, so we, clear, we do need that. We can put on all these questions, but I just feel like things we're having a brick wall every time we get the answer back. Yeah, I think we need to reflect on, on, on what we can do further in relation to this. Clark, you've advised us of tools that are available to us in terms of committee motions and, and, and issues like that as well. Maybe this is, a, this is a, an issue that, we, uh, that we, we consider a committee motion on, maybe to get this fully, fully debated and responded to by a, a minister or, or ideally ministers. I don't think that normally happens, but... There is a, a key, key issue here, is the, the cross-departmental nature of this issue between education and health. Um, maybe we can have a think about that, but are members any other immediate actions that we need to add to those that the clerk has outlined? Chair, Chair just to say that I think that it's, it's important that um, the next time that we meet um, will be on the 3rd of November, albeit informally with the special school principals. Um, and I think that that's really important because um, on the back of uh, the meeting and of the all party group yesterday um, and what I heard and then what we have just heard today, um, I think it's important that we do meet with, with the special school principals as well. Uh, absolutely, that, that is in the schedule, uh, uh, Clark, yeah. Okay. Okay, members agreed with those actions, yeah. Sure, it's just very quick. I don't think we can delay on this. Can we get the wheels in motion on a motion? The wheels is a very good yeah, okay. um, uh, Members, what I would advise you first is that there's a consultation underway on the um, this sort of um, uh, cross departmental action plan, uh, which is meant to assist these groups. Um, so that's what the minister would say uh, in response to any motion. Um, also, I don't think we have an awful lot, uh, although there are very useful testimony there. We don't have an awful lot of answers. I think uh, what you'd be best advised to do is to 
We'll write these letters, get what answers we get, ask priority written questions, get what answers you're going to get. We'll have the department and the DOH and the Education Authority up here on the 18th of November talking about the feedback to this consultation. And if you're still dissatisfied with what you've heard, um, then there, there's a, a really good juncture uh, to uh, bring forward a motion, if that's where you are. And you can also see how your motion goes on uh, the 2nd of November. Um, around um, the post-primary transfer, just to see how the department responds uh, yeah. to that. And the, yeah, Justin, perhaps we, we could okay. work on draft text as yeah. well, yeah. Um, to make sure that something is there ready to go if and when um, pertinent to do so. Okay, I appreciate, appreciate the urgency of it. Members agreed? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, agreed. thank you. Members, if you, if yeah. you bear with us, we've just got to make our way through committee business that, uh, from earlier. Bart, shall we move to correspondence, agenda item eight, or? Oh, okay then, yeah, let's, let's, okay. Yeah, yeah, let, let's do that. Yeah. Very good. I'm happy to take your lead if you need to get other items dealt with. The forward work programme, I'm sure we can come to that after correspondence, as that's what we normally do. So okay, that's correspondence, sensible. agenda item eight, uh, members. Mm -hmm. Refer members to page 186, where we have 12 items of correspondence. You might want to mute yourself until you, you need to speak at this point. Um, page 186, 12 items of correspondence and a summary note at 187 to 190. Clark. So, Chairperson, I'm just asking members if they're content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note at page 187. Um, and there's just a few things to pick out. At page 194, this is a response from the Department on Post-Primary Transfer. They've provided information by post-primary uh, school and geographical area on the level of oversubscription and the associated additional places which were provided from 2018 uh, and what they're planning on providing for 2021. They've also provided um, uh, the post-primary preference information for 2020. So that sets out the numbers of first, second and third, fourth preferences which were made and which were accepted by schools. And this shows a small number of schools that only appear to have accepted first preferences last year. Uh, additionally, the department has provided some information on post-primary appeals, which Mr Newton asked about. There seem to have been about 200 per year. Um, half the time, it would appear the schools do not attend. Um, and about a quarter of those appeals are successful. DE has also provided the post-primary timetable for admissions um, but has provided no detail on contingency planning, further contingency planning uh, in this regard. So um, that is uh, uh, that, that sort of key timetable, uh, which has now been adjusted because of the um, change to the post-primary transfer testing and for other reasons. So can I ask Chairperson if the committee is content to maybe write to the department suggesting that the information on preferences and acceptances by schools be put into the public domain if it isn't there already? Um, in order to inform a parental choice around post-primary transfer. Agreed. 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 Members happy? Yep. Okay, yeah, very, good, very good. Thank you. Um, so then at uh, 8.4, uh, which is at page uh, 241 and at page 244, we have correspondence from a parent and a teacher indicating concerns that the, they believe that the minister has disregarded their opinions expressed by respondents to the SIA exam and curriculum consultation. Um, the committee's already written uh, to the department uh, about this. Uh, can I ask if members are content to note this and forward the, depart the committee's response to the consultation uh, to those correspondents so they can see where the committee was? Agreed, that members. Was Say that one again, Peter. Right, so uh, this is um, uh, some a parent and a teacher writing to us saying, oh, the minister hasn't listened to us in this consultation about the uh, examination and curriculum. Um, what I propose we do as the, the consultation is now closed is say look here's what the committee thought um, and um, and sort of leave it at that sorry thanks I said that very quickly um, and then the only other one yeah was uh, page 255 invitation to the chairperson to attend a girl guiding zoom event uh, from 7 to 9 on the 4th of November so can I ask if the committee are content for the chairperson to attend diary permitting that agreed chairperson content Thank you. Very good. And that was um, basically that. Other than in tabled items, we have correspondence from the department, including a notice made under the Coronavirus Act. Um, this will allow schools to make payments to parents in lieu of uh, free school meals 
during the period of the extension to the Halloween break. So uh, can I ask if uh, members are content just to note this? The committee has already written to the department about free school meals over this break, but also the general position around free school meals as well. So if there are content, Chairperson, with that. Okay. Members content? Okay. Content. Okay. Thank you. No. Okay. <coughs> Members and Clark Ford Work Program, agenda item two. Thanks, Chairperson. As we're a wee bit thin in the ground here, uh, and members have done very well. Um, the, the, the first bit, which was at um, page 107, I'd had some deep thoughts about um, you know, members being um, a bit dissatisfied with the answers that they, they indicated to me that they were getting from uh, SIA and from the Department and the Education Authority. And uh, if you just look at the balance of our forward work programme, what we've been up to up until now, it's been a lot of department and not that much of stakeholders. Forward work programme, Clark, sorry, is at page 108 of it members' is. packs. Yep, thank Indeed. You. Sorry, thank you. Well That's done. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, the suggestion was that the committee make a kind of call for evidence where uh, we'll just put something up on the internet saying, look, stakeholders, write to us about your experience of COVID-19, about lockdown and about restart. Um, and then we could book these people in, just like people we've heard today, and as we've heard in our informal meetings as well. And uh, you'll get their information into the light of day. And then when we've gathered up a good bit, have done a good bit of homework, um, gathered up a good bit of information, members could then consider if they wish to either just bring in a committee motion or maybe even produce a short report, which they'd be allowed to do under Standing Order 46.7, and then have maybe having that debated. Um, so that would be a way forward to get all these stakeholders, the, the things that are being said, get it into the light of day, provide a degree of challenge, give the department the opportunity to refute what is being said, and then, if you're still unhappy, committee motion or report on the committee motion, and then maybe you might get more um, satisfactory answers, chairperson members. Um, what I would suggest is maybe you have a think about that and we can come back to this um, after Halloween because you're probably all very tired. Okay, members content to consider that approach and, and then return to it, yeah. It does seem like a sensible way to try and focus in on particular themes and issues um, with a COVID um, relation uh, and then to produce something at the end of that that hopefully could be of some use to the department in terms of its response to that. Agreed? Okay, thank you. And uh, then, Chair, just moving on to the Forward Work Programme itself, which is hopefully indicated as 108, as uh, Ms Kelly has just reminded us, um, we have a meeting with special school principals on the 3rd of uh, November. I know the timing doesn't suit all members, but it does seem to be the only one that actually works for now, um, and it will inform the committee's scrutiny of special schools area planning briefing, which will be the next day on the 4th of uh, November. Um, if you have just a, a quick scoot through the forward work programme, I've written to the department and asked if the minister could come and talk to the committee about um, lockdown and restart and um, circuit break, etc. Um, they haven't come back to me yet, but I imagine when they do, um, we'll have to rearrange things. Um, but I'm keeping, uh, in any event, the 16th of December. Uh, you can see that the, sorry, the forward work programme is pretty full up to Christmas. 16th of December keeping that reason to be light because there'll usually be something exciting will happen then that you want to talk about. And then I'm suggesting we come back early on the 6th of January, do our effective questioning and the planning session then. And, um, and what's the other thing? Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully members will be happy enough with that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was that on the 4th of November, uh, we've been asked to finish early, which would mean we'd have to start early. So. What's going on is standing committees, um, their membership clashes with people who are members of standing committees, for example, Daniel McCrossan and others, are also members of other statutory committees which meet on Wednesday afternoons. So they're trying to meet at lunchtime. Um, there's a limit on the number of available rooms, but the, I think the key issue is the, the clashing memberships. So consequently, um, I think it's, um, well, it might be, I can't remember, it might be standards and privileges, want to meet um, at about 12.30 on the 4th of December. So they want us to finish at 12 noon. In order to do that, we'd have to start at 9 a.m. I know that's not particularly convenient, but we will have to do this about once every three weeks because apparently this was agreed at Chairperson's Liaison Group 
Um, so if uh, just to members to note that. I, I, I'm a lone voice frequently, a chairperson's liaison group. <laughs> I'll, I'll copy that back quickly. <laughs> but, um. but, but there we are. So members, so that's 4th of November, 9 o'clock start, but we will finish at 12. So sorry about that, but um, uh, the evidence sessions organised for that day are in line with that shorter time as well. I sh we should add, yeah. Yeah, we should just about be able to do it. But the members have done very well today with their time. And uh, so the final thing, if members are content, chairperson. Yeah, go ahead, Clark. Final. Th uh, final thing is children, young people strategy. This is in tabled items. So we were to have a briefing on this last week. Very important strategy. I know members are very interested in it. But the department has written back and said that the minister had intended to bring this strategy to the executive soon. And um, if we delayed the briefing until the 2nd of December, which is what I'd suggested, that might delay it till after the new year. I didn't think members would want to do that. So what I'd suggest the committee does is write to the department indicating um, that it's content on a without prejudice basis for the strategy to proceed to the executive. Ask a number of questions, which I've set out in the draft, uh, in the draft letter there, and, uh, and then uh, you take the briefing on the 2nd of December, but then ask the department to come back again in the new year when they have the full implementation plan and the, the outcome indicators and all that good stuff. Um, the questions I suggested that members might be interested in getting the answer to would be around um, the position of the UNCRC, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and you know, to what extent departments are going to be required to listen to the voice of the child in uh, developing their policies and delivering their services. And there are other things which the strategy mentioned around, for example, children of faith not being stereotyped, and children of no faith um, being able to not participate in um, religious activities that they're fundamentally opposed to. And there's also a question about how the department is going to manage all of this when it's, you know, they're experts in education, um, how are they going to look after and sort of manage this strategy going forward. So if members are content to take that approach, which I've just rattled through. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Very good. Agreed. That's it. Okay. It will be then. Okay. Should I do uh, chairperson's <laughs> business briefly? Well, that's a good Sorry. idea, chairperson. Uh, uh, agenda item four, members, just to remind members, uh, that members of the committee met with Angel Eyes on Tuesday the 19th of October. A note of proceedings is circulated. Angel Eyes uh, has raised questions about the provision of support to uh, blind and partially sighted children. Um, can I seek the committee's agreement to write to the Education Authority seeking information on why 126 of the 1,000 blind and partially sighted children supported by the Education Authority Vision Support Service in receipt of assistive technology to support learning and access to their curriculum and what criteria used to determine the allocation, uh, how the Education Authority ensures that children and young people with a visual impairment receive accessible resources uh, and um, sorry, accessible source and equity in learning throughout school closure. And I think the, the rest of the questions may be with you as well. Is that right, Clark? That's yeah. right, Chairperson. Yeah. I circulated the note from uh, Angel Eyes, um, which set out the questions they'd like to ask. So if members are content for um, the committee to write to the department uh, in those terms and following up on the issues which Angel Eyes uh, mentioned during the informal meeting. Members content? Yeah. Great, Probably. thank you. Okay, uh, 4.2 then. Can I just advise members that during question time, the Minister referred to a delay to the autumn examination series owing to the longer than expected Halloween break. Can I ask the committee to note that the BBC has clarified in respect of the delay to the autumn examination series? series? Uh, is that agreed? Any comments in relation to that or members content to note? Nope. Okay, content to note. 4.3 is school attendance. Can I ask members to note that during question time, the Minister indicated that school pupil attendance was around 93.7% with 1,491 individual COVID cases, which appeared to include 352 teachers and staff. And remind members that the committee has already written to the department seeking further information and breakdown on the number of infection in schools and how the department and education authority and the PHA are working together to track progress of the virus. 
Briefly, members, it's my understanding that the coding of people absence includes a, a code with the letter P and a number eight for when pupils are self-isolating and it remains unclear, it seems, as to whether or not such absences are included in the figures that have been provided to us to date. Um, despite, I'm fairly certain, me asking the Minister and the Department whether self-isolation was included in absences and being told that it was, there seems to be significant um, view to the contrary. Members content to note that matter for now or any other comments? Note. Noted. Okay, I think a few of us have asked questions to follow that up in that regard as well. Um, the purpose of which is to try and understand what um, schools and teachers are facing and, and indeed what disruption pupils are experiencing. Okay, uh, agenda item five, draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 14th of October at page 116 of their packs and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Um, agenda item six, no matters arising. Okay. Any other business? Okay, then members, the date, time, and place of our next meeting is Wednesday the 4th of November in room 29 for Anvas Starley at 9 a.m. The committee does now adjourn. Thanks, members. Push the button. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.